Kef Connect. Conversations that matter. Tune in every week for interviews with industry trendsetters and community changemakers that will instill inspiration and ignite action. Visit www.kefholdings.com and click Kef Connect to listen. Hello and welcome to Kef Connect, a podcast designed to inspire. This is season three for the love of learning. And in episode two, we're looking at the evolution of education with our very special guests today. We have American University in Dubai faculty member, Dr. Nadira Alborno. Hello. We have a business news anchor, Maya Hojej. Hello, nice and we have a social media manager, Nicolo Horl. <laughs> Haliores. <laughs> and we practice that specifically. Haliores. <laughs> now, this is a Spanish name, isn't yeah. it? So I, I need to learn my Spanish. So, Nicolo Haliores. Correct. Thank you all for coming on the show. Welcome to the podcast. And I'm going to start the questions with, in your own lifetime, how has education evolved? How have you seen it change? What trends have you witnessed? And is there anything that you wish was available when you were at school? I'll start with you, Dr. Nadira. Okay, uh, thinking about the trends, really, I've been teaching for 20 years now. Um, one main thing is collaborative learning, is now we have moved from the teacher being the sage on the stage into becoming the facilitator in the classroom, where you facilitate learning. So a teacher feels that she's there to learn from her students and to create opportunities for everyone to learn together, to, ta- to tap into each other's experiences, resources, um, skills, and it helps us to understand each other, uh, where do we come from, diversity, which we'll talk a lot about later. The other thing, just one more thing, mm-hmm. is um, uh, the, the trend that has been happening right now is self-directed professional development, is that now I can learn anything I want, and of course technology is key here. And Maya, what have you witnessed in, in your... Because you teach as well. Yes, I teach. As well as, I'm being an a news, yeah. as well as being a news anchor. So I teach journalism. And in the past 10 years of teaching journalism, this has changed a lot. What we teach has changed. And the atmosphere in the classroom has changed a lot. But uh, what really changed is what I was learning uh, when I was in school over 20 years ago. And what I learned when I uh, decided to go for a master's degree 20 years later, the difference um, in the atmosphere in the classroom has changed a lot. And the learning experience has become two-way. It's not only you are learning from your instructor, he is or she is learning from you as well. And this is is where the learning experience becomes uh, expanded. Also, just like Dr. Nadira said, we are now in a gig economy. So we can learn anything we want to hone our skills and become better at what we would like to do. So let's say I am, I'm a psychologist, but I love music. So I can start working on art therapy uh, or music therapy. Th- these are things that we learn, we get skills from with all the technology. And from YouTube, you can learn things without even paying for them. So <laughs> maybe, maybe it's, it, it, it's an example. Social media expert, I'm sure you know all about YouTube lessons. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, I'm not an educator by profession, but I am really like an avid learner. And the one thing that I've noticed is like the mode and attitude towards learning. So if I may just give you like a personal anecdote, I I say this all the time. I come from a typewriter generation. I'm old enough to have actually had to use a typewriter. And the attitude towards, you know, learning and expression there is that, you know, before you commit anything to that paper, you have to be 100% sure. Because if you make one small mistake, that paper goes on the bin or you're going to have to use a whiteout. That's going to be a lot of hassle. So before, like uh, my, my uh, contemporaries and I, we would draft everything by hand first and then type it. So to me, that, that expresses like a, like a huge difference in the way, you know, my generation used to learn and the way this generation now, you know, manages to learn. Before, we had to be like 100% sure. And just, just the simple effort of going from your house to the library, that already is a big difference because you're bodily like uh, relocating yourself with an attitude towards learning. But now it's a lot more convenient. You can learn on your phone. You could learn on the bus. You could burn, learn on the metro. You could learn while you're, while you're on the treadmill. So it's really that attitude and the mode of learning that's changed. And it's really quite interesting to see how it has evolved. So we have a can-do attitude yeah. in today's 
educational landscape, but something that we've been dealing with a lot in the news lately is the multicultural landscape. And I know, Dr. Nadira, that that is something that you actually teach teachers how to manage a multicultural classroom. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes. Um, Dubai, especially, that we live in Dubai, and classrooms in Dubai are like a microcosm of the world. If you look at teachers and students, they come from all over the world. And so you have a classroom with so many nationalities. Our role as a t- teachers and responsibility as a teacher, we have to empower our students to find the best of who they are, to find their best potentials. In order to do that, you need to know the students. Now, this, this, this endeavor, uh, endeavor to know the students is something means that you have to know who they are, where they come from, you have to know something about their culture, and then you need to know about their uh, learning styles, their interests, uh, their readiness levels. All this requires you as a teacher, number one is to have the intention to do that and to believe that this is the only way that you can teach them because you need to reach them to be able to teach them. And without knowing them, you cannot teach your students. So we speak a lot about this mindset, the mindset of the importance of knowing your students. And, and, then, and then all the strategies of how to know your students in the classroom, you can think of all kinds of strategies, and they can be very simple. As simple as um, if we are in the classroom, uh, meeting and greeting at the door. Uh, okay, now we're in Zoom, then let's log in 10 minutes before and, and allow the students to come in and speak about themselves. Or create activities like bulletin boards where they can share something about themselves, about their culture, about what their interests are. But it's very important that we tap into who they are because they need to be, f- they need to feel that they are known. When they feel they are known, we are motivating them to, to learn. Mm-hmm. But for the teachers to do that, they need to also know who they are mm-hmm. because they need to understand that their culture, mm-hmm. their, their uh, prejudices, their biases, their assumptions, they walk into the classrooms with all that. Mm-hmm. And they, teachers, we teach who we are. This is mm-hmm. Parker uh, Palmer said, we teach who we are. So unless we understand who we are, and that's what we work a lot with our teachers, is to understand who they are, understand their background, their social identity, how their social identity was formed. And we do a lot of exercises. One of them was, uh, the, I shared with you the link for the implicit bias. Mm-hmm. You do that test. It's a test on available, and it's a, a, month, uh, it's a long-term study by uh, University of Harvard and Washington. And it is to know your implicit bias, the things that you don't know you have. And this is available online? It is available online. So anybody listening can get this online, and it's called the Implicit Implicit Bias bias. Test. Yeah. And you'll be so surprised. This is a requirement for my teachers when they enter the program. And they are so surprised that, no, I'm not biased against color. I'm not biased against, you know, this ethnicity. This, But then they realize that there is, like, maybe moderate even. Once you look at your bias, and once you look at your assumptions, you identify them, Mm -hmm. then it means that then you'll start working towards um, not portraying it in the classroom. Or you start thinking, like, how do I behave in the classroom? How do I connect with my students? Do I really connect with my students with equity? Do I really provide equal opportunities for all my students to grow? Or does my bias and assumptions come and play a role here? So that's, again, a very important thing. So when teachers know who they are, mm-hmm. this can reflect so well on moving into their classrooms and the class is always so exciting because teachers are just, you know, you don't know that this exists, actually, that I, I have to know myself, to know my students. Because whenever you say we teach multicultural education, the first thing they say, yeah, we need to know the cult- different cultures of our students so we understand how to teach them. I said, what about you? What about yeah. your assumptions? <laughs> what about your bias? Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very exciting uh, thing, and we all need to know it so that we know who we are, so we can grow. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that that would work just as well in the workplace. Absolutely. For, for to put yourself Absolutely. through that test, mm-hmm. to find out your prejudices, so you can move forward yeah. in any environment, now, classroom, in offices, workplace, mm-hmm. In all offices, they speak about diversity training. Mm-hmm. But the problem, again, there's a big problem there. As they say, we have diverse... Uh, um, uh, environment so we throw money on it and we have diversity training but what we need to think about is inclusion 
is inclusion. Mm -hmm. Because diversity is knowing that it's there. But inclusion is actually providing an accessible and equal opportunity environment. For everyone. Yes, knowing ma'am. how to do it. It's not just knowing that it's there. Mm-hmm. Okay? It's knowing how to do it, how to connect with people, how to be interested in connecting with people. Mm-hmm. And that's why, I've just last one last thing, is the biggest project in that, uh, in that course is that they do an ethnography, which is ethnography is a study of another culture. Mm-hmm. So they choose a culture that they have an issue with. And they have to find someone where they interview and they spend time with. And they have to, you know, interview and spend time and know their culture and, you know, shed all these assumptions and shed all these. And that experience, then connecting with another person that is so different from you, helps you then in the future to open doors Mm -hmm. and open minds. Amazing. Beautiful. What do I enroll? (laughs) 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 Sounds beautiful. (laughs) Uh, Maya, you're, yes. you're, as I said, also a teacher, and um, you're very focused on female empowerment yes. and female education. How has that changed? Because that's had a bit of a revolution in our okay. lifetime. <laughs> oh, definitely, well, right? big time. But before I start, disclaimer. Mm. Zero judgment to any woman who decides to make up her own mind and uh, make uh, her own decision about how she is going to lead her life. So if her choice is to stay at home, be a stay-at-home mother or Just do nothing. It's her decision, and it's up to her. So no judgment there. But having said that, um, during growing up or 20 years ago, let's say 30 years ago, going back, um, girls in school and classes, they were top students compared to to boys. They were always better at many things in class. And then at university, when many of them did manage to go to university, they were top students. They studied engineering. They studied medicine. But then they decided to get married and have kids, and engineering was not um, suitable for a mother. And being a doctor, long hours, no, I couldn't be. Uh, I couldn't work in ER. I had to work at a clinic. So th- there were there were a lot of restraints. So what we work with, I worked with uh, Reach Mentoring for Women at one point. What we do is try to. Um, think outside the box and think outside our own boxes and see how we can grow ourselves, how we can move forward, how we can achieve goals, um, set goals and work towards those those goals and do not restrain yourself. I can be a mother and still be successful. I can work. I can choose not to be a mother. It's my choice. It's my decision. I can uh, move forward with my own choices. I think this is the main key, the, the, the key message that you want. It's my choice. I'm going to move forward with it in education, in uh, career, in moving forward. But definitely, definitely, I mean, I'm a big, big supporter of education and moving forward and growing and continuous education, continuous learning, never never to stop learning and always to grow internally and externally. Um, it, when it comes to mentor, uh, mentorship, one of the biggest things we, we talk about in leadership, when a woman is applying for a leadership position, She's always afraid that she's not good enough. So she always thinks, I need to learn more. I need to take an extra course here. I need to do this. I need to know more. I have to have two more years experience. When a man is offered that job, he is so confident and feel he's always <laughs> feeling that he deserves it. So in, during the interview, when you're interviewing a man and a woman with exactly the same potential and the same credentials, mm-hmm. you will t- subconsciously lean towards the man because he has more confidence in his abilities. So this is what we need to work on. Now, the opportunities today are there for men and women equally, and you have to go with the person that is better for the job. Who would you choose, the man or the woman? There is a misconception that women, oh, she's going to have kids, and she's going to run for her baby. Mm -hmm. But with a man, if he is that type, if he runs for his baby, you'd you'd say, how cute, look (laughs) at him, he's helping out. And this yeah. is what we need to change. The, we need to change the narrative. They, this is a partnership, mm-hmm. wherever it is, and they are equally involved in every aspect. And as an employer, when I look at their CVs, I need to see who's better. I'm not going to pick the women because I want to show that I have diversity. Yeah. I'm not going to pick the man because he is more confident. Who is better suited mm-hmm. for the job or for moving forward? So it comes down to the employers as well as the employees to look at that slight gender difference and consider that when you're actually hiring. Oh, definitely. And women today have so much more opportunities. These are things, there are laws, 
we live in, we live in the UAE there are laws that make you hire women ha- yes, that ma'am. make you give equal pay many other countries don't have that mm-hmm. my home my home country civil laws against women are horrible we're not going to get into that yeah. but um but look we live in a country that gives us all that that yeah. make the best out of it use it the opportunity is yes, here that's wasteful not to of course Can I just yeah. add something about mm-hmm. women uh, yes. which is um Women, now all literature is talking about women having the social, emotional skills that actually men don't have. Mm. Yes. And that makes them so much suitable sometimes for mm-hmm. leadership jobs mm-hmm. because they had the social, emotional, mm-hmm. they, yeah. which they, the world used to look at it as, as a weakness. Mm-hmm. But exactly. it's actually showing now that yes. this yeah. is actually the strength that we need in leadership. Exactly. So if, uh, if I may, uh, you reminded me of something. There's a recent study by um, Goldman Sachs because Goldman Sachs really invests in women's studies. And uh, women CEOs in 2019, because 2020 was a little tricky, and in the first half of 2020, women CEOs were more successful in bringing in investments. Why? Because they invest in ESG, which is uh, uh, environmental, social, and uh, governance. Mm-hmm. Uh, these investments... Women take risks there because they are thinking of the future of our planet. They mm-hmm. are thinking of the future of our generations. Mm-hmm. So there are opportunities there. Mm-hmm. There are better opportunities yeah. for women in the industry. And then it feels like it's almost going to come full circle in that um, we're saying women's emotional intelligence will help them succeed in this era. Mm-hmm. But then it's down to the parents of today to then with their sons not use that terminology of big boys you're a boy cry yeah <laughs> those you know allow boys the same Balance. freedoms yeah. to be emotional right i'm um, yeah. talking of boys <laughs> <laughs> Nicola, you are a social media expert yeah. how do you feel that the social media landscape is playing into education today do you think it's it's often accused of being a big distraction is it actually helping anywhere or is it just a hindrance well It can help, it does help, but it can also be a hindrance. But then again, that's something that can be said about most things in life, really. True. Right? Like, it's really up to the person on how they regulate themselves on the use of social media. On one hand, you know, you, we have greater access to information now more than ever. But at the same time, that can also be, you know, like a double-edged sword because we have so many opportunities uh, that can distract us. But one thing that I like, I like to explain when I, whenever I do social media workshops or seminars is that the key to understanding how social media works is to think about what's in the best interest of that social media platform. Because at the end of the day, it's really a business. They want to make money. Like Mark Zuckerberg's not in this for the charity of it. They want oh, no. to <laughs> make money, obviously. So you have to understand that, you know, what are the decisions that are At the, for the best interest of the social media platform. Okay, so social media, without getting into the nitty-gritties of algorithms, like they're really designed to serve you the most engaging and the most relevant content as possible because they want to keep you glued to the platform. They want you to stay in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, they want you to be glued to the platform because the longer you stay, let's say in Facebook, that gives them more opportunities to serve you ads. That gives them more machine learning because then, you know, the targeting becomes more specific. It becomes more sophisticated, which will then, uh, you know, translate to better results for the advertisers. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's always a business to them, Mm -hmm. right? So you as a a citizen, as a netizen, it behooves you, and and this uh, goes back to what... uh, to what has been mentioned in the panel right now, it all goes back to self-awareness and self-regulation. Like there are ways for you to kind of sort of limit the, dis- the distracting factors in social media or in the internet. For example, like you can report ads mm-hmm. or you could like mark uh, uh, the YouTube content that appear on your feed. You can mark it as irrelevant. You could clear your cookies. You could uh, adjust your personal ad settings in Google. There are so many things that all boil down to habit. And that's really what it's all about. It's about you regulating the habit. It, it, there are ways like to technically protect yourself from, you know, from being distracted. But at the end of the day, it's all down to your focus. It's, it's, that's really all there is to it. If you need to put a timeline, put a timeline. Mm-hmm. Like if you need to like set up alarms on your phone, do it. Yeah. 
But it all goes back to your attitude as a student and as a learner. Like the internet is there; it's a great thing. It's bridged. It's created, you know, many connections. Mm-hmm. It's made the world a lot smaller. But it's gonna get you <laughs> if you let it. <laughs> so don't let it. I, I'm fine with all others except for Instagram. Instagram just hooks oh me God. and pulls me in. So I've set. In the um, settings on Instagram, there's actually a timer, and I've set it so when I've been on for one hour a day, it pops up and says you've been on one Stop hour. Stop it! Yeah. <laughs> for so, me, for me, it's YouTube. Oh my God, YouTube is an abyss. And like yeah. I, I always say this, like sometimes I feel like YouTube's algorithms know me better than I know myself. <laughs> Maya, how do you stay focused? You're news anchor and a teacher you've got a lot of work on i have two kids i uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's crazy i'm a single mom <laughs> and uh and the podcast and i mean it, again it's not easy and uh, when people what going back to social media when people see what people see on your feeds and your social media they think that life is all uh, flowers and mm-hmm. and uh, you're always happy and you know there are times when you're really not okay and you're all over the place and you can't focus but at the end of the day it's setting um, your goals and working towards them i don't like to say hard work because it doesn't have to be hard it has to be uh, persistent you have to be persistent you have to be resilient and you have to keep going and going set the goal and keep working you might not succeed the first time you will the second or the third or the fourth mm-hmm. if you are if you really believe that that's what you want you're going to go and get it and that's how you stay focused there's a goal you focus maybe not tunnel vision because you will need other people's input at one point or another uh, or another but then step by step you're going to get there to whatever it is that you want or you dream of. And when you set your goals, is this a, you know, the beginning of 2021, did you sit down with a notepad and pen and vision come board. up with your vision board? I do, I do, do a, a vision, vision board. I do a vision board uh, every year. I've been doing it for three years and I, I'm shocked at how accurate this vision board is every single I've year. I've heard this from everybody it's who I amazing. know who yeah. does vision boards has said it's, this. Uh, I have to do it. I just can't get over the hurdle you would feeling not like it's a bit sort of school it's just about education i guess it fits, you know like it's just like thing. a it's it's a, it's like i do it with my kids sometimes but then um at one one point my daughter didn't believe in it another point my son didn't believe in it but still we still do it at the beginning of every year we put a vision board we sit we cut we paper cut do things print out things from the internet and we stick them on uh, on the vision board and every single year this is what I want. If I achieve 70% of it, I mean, I wanted to travel 2020. I mean, that's the one thing I didn't achieve. But <laughs> almost everything else, um, thank God, I've, I've managed to go through one way or another with some differences. But I believe a vision board, you have it there. It's yeah. your focus. You see it every morning when you wake up, every night before you go to sleep. It's there. It keeps I it in your doing fresh. Vision board now. <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I feel like I've got FOMO. I'm left out. Yeah. What, what about you, Dr. Nadira? Um, what, what do you do to keep your focus on your goals? I think the vision board is in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, I do set goals. It's, it's setting goals all the time. But mm-hmm. I've learned through the years to be also flexible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because sometimes, uh, I've in before, I, I was always an A-type uh, young, being younger and uh, I think I hurt myself sometimes and probably achieved less by being so focused on that that's a goal I set it I have to I think it's good to be flexible because life throws things at you mm-hmm. that can actually teach you a lot more than the goal that you have set so I've learned to be more flexible about my goals there are certain ones that I have to meet things to do with my job things to do with my family but uh, but at the same time, I'm. I think I like to feel that I have become more flexible uh, along the years, and uh, and it has been good because I actually so many years I achieved a lot more than what I thought I would by being flexible, but by being focused on wanting to achieve. But I think that's, I mean, by nature, I am a person who wants to achieve. <laughs> mm. yeah. But also, uh, I'm I'm always open to new experiences and new things that are coming my way. And with the, you mentioned that you went back to do your masters. Yes. Um, what's what's the landscape like for mature students? Is that more accessible than it than it used to be? I, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. 
in class, um, my professor was a colleague of mine because I, I taught at the same school. So uh, at the beginning, it was, and some of the students in class were ex-students of mine who I, I had graduated at one point or another. It was a bit of a challenge, the first two classes, but the learning experience was amazing. I mean, it was a challenge because I don't, I don't want any of my students to be better than me. And I'm, it's, I mean, I'm very proud of all my students and I'm very proud when any of them is very successful. But then being the teacher, yeah. that was a bit of a challenge. Yeah. So I wanted to get a GPA of four and all I was really focused. But the learning experience when you're older, you enjoy more. The challenges are different. When you're in class, when you're doing your research, you're doing it for the experience of learning, not because you want to get the A or the B or because mommy wants that or daddy wants that and I have to achieve and I have to make them proud. Now you're learning for the sake of learning, for the enjoyment of learning, and it's so different. I would urge anyone at any time. I mean, now I was just, before we went in, I was telling Dr. Nadira, I want to go for my PhD. What do you recommend? I'll talk to you after we, we do this because we I want should. to do that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And are there a lot of mature students in Dubai? In yes, yes. yes, I think I, it's growing. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't like this before. I went for my PhD in a, later in life. Mm -hmm after my kids went to, to I mean, high school. And, uh, and I think it's wonderful because there are opportunities for part-time uh, students now. I mean, my, my uh, uh, graduate students are all mature students because they're teachers, they're all working. Mm -hmm. So, and the, ra the age range, as you said, it ranges from 22 to 55. And uh, the learning that happens there, because you see the younger ones are like more tech savvy, while the older ones are just learning. But then, the opportunities that are open for everyone and they learn from each other. Again, I go back to collaborative learning. Mm -hmm. It is wonderful to see it across ages, across nationalities, across diversity from all kinds. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think Dubai is moving towards that for sure. I wouldn't say it was the case about 10 or 15 years ago mm -hmm. when I was looking for a program to finish my PhD, to, to do my PhD. But uh, now it is, there are a lot of programs and uh, yes, and I think more opportunities for women and men as well. Yeah. My husband did his master's degree about five years ago only. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it, and it was a different, uh, a different field completely, again, mm. offered I here in Dubai. I don't know, I'm sorry, I just don't know if we mentioned, uh, because we did talk about it, the learning experience is a two-way experience nowadays. So mm -hmm. you learn from your students also as they learn from you. So it's mm -hmm. a two-way experience at the moment. So that helps so a lot. So it's a very different classroom to the one that I grew completely. up in. Yeah, completely. And Nicola, you do video and photography uh, yeah, in my line of work, because I, I, I manage an account which is like one of the biggest imaging brands in the world. So, so uh, we specialize, of course, in photography and, and videography. Mm -hmm. But like, I, mean, I, I can add to this discussion by saying that, you know, my particular line of work, social media, like you have to be constantly learning, yeah. constantly. Like mm -hmm. you are really only as, as educated as your last post. Because uh, social media changes so much that you have to be constantly like on the lookout for what's changing in the platform. What are the new advertising models? What are the new platforms that we can look at? So what, are for the, what are the algorithms today? Yeah, to exactly. So you, you have minutes. and like um, when like whenever a platform changes anything, it's not like they send out a memo. Mm -hmm. Like you're gonna, you're just gonna have to like, uh, what, what's happened today? <laughs> what? Why can't I do this anymore? So like you have to be constantly switched on. And like, if I may give a testimony, so I do that because I, I use this thing called Zest. Uh, it's, it's a program that you, it's kind of a plug in, mm -hmm. in Chrome, mm -hmm. that uh, you, you uh, install that and it automatically curates for you. Like What's our it called? Zest. Zest. Z-E-S-T. So for communicators, it's a huge thing because like it automatically curates uh, some, some of the latest articles for you with regards to advertising and social media and marketing and things like that. Oh, so I'll use that. That's so nice. like, have so that for yeah. teachers as well. So oh, whenever I open that. my browser in Google, I don't go um, it doesn't get sent immediately because I set it as my homepage. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I see are like new articles about about my line of work, which is always great because then if I'm going to get distracted, I might as well get distracted by something I make money out that's of. That's useful. That's yeah, useful. that's useful. Yeah. <laughs> Not like, you know, plumbing or something <laughs> that sometimes, you know, YouTube serves me. And 
what about with your with the courses that you run? What are the what are the age ranges in those courses? Oh wow, it come it it's it's as young as we have a kids photo club. So it's as young as 5 years old. Mm-hmm. But then it extends all the way up to like the 60 year olds. Oh, so yeah. wow. all ages. All ages, all yeah. ages. And it's and it's so interesting to see like the level of enthusiasm that is consistent across all age brackets like everyone are just into it because like what i think what's special about photography in particular is that you've already invested in the gear and it's a significant <laughs> amount of money it's like it's not it's not like you know like an impulse buy you've had to th- think about buying this camera so you're already in so like you wanna you wanna be good at it and just the level of engagement that we get from our you know from our uh, classes it's really really fascinating it's it's it speaks a lot to the culture of you know of artistry and creativity in the region that we're all trying to self actualize and move you know move towards the art realm because we all want to self express so where can we sign up for these videography and photography uh, you could uh, uh, we, we always constantly update our social media pages so I'm, I work in Nikon so just go to at Nikon MEA on Facebook and on Instagram and you'll see our lineup of classes there. And you can also look at our lineup of classes at nikonschool-ae.com. Brilliant. And yeah. Maya, where can we watch you telling us the news each day? <laughs> so there's, we, have a, we have an online applica- uh, application. It's called Now. But if you go to asharkbusiness.com, uh, you will find uh, uh, we, 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 do, uh, we curate our content with Bloomberg. So we use Bloomberg's content um, from English to Arabic. So that's uh, Ashark with Bloomberg. That's where you can find us. And you can find me on Instagram. I have my own content that is uh, relevant to how to present the news uh, in Arabic and how to um, uh, orally articulate, uh, like orally interpret and orally articulate uh, content. So it's maya.hajaj on Instagram. So. And your podcast? My podcast. Okay, so I have to. <laughs> <laughs> I had a podcast called Rakwit Ahwe, and it was one of the top podcasts in uh, 2020 in the region. And now, uh, and it's about women empowerment, and we tell stories of amazing women from history, and uh, from w- women who are around us. And the new podcast is called Ahwe Khabriye, and it is also available on uh, all podcast uh, formats. Um, Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Play. You can find it on Spotify and Rami and Deezer. And it's also uh, interviews with women um, today, and we compare it with uh, women from history. So first doctor in, uh, hist- in history of Arabia with a doctor today. What's the difference between then and now? What has changed? Wow. And it's definitely... Yes, great angle. So the, our tagline is everyone has a story, and each story is worth telling. Mm. Fabulous. And where can I sign up? To be a mature student. <laughs> You're very welcome <laughs> to the American <laughs> University in Dubai School of Education. <laughs> Fabulous. But also, our, uh, we, we, we're quite active on uh, social media. <laughs> so our Instagram, our mm-hmm. school Instagram, uh, which is actually very inspiring because we put... Uh, Images of our classrooms, what kind of uh, what kind of discussions we're having, uh, what the projects the teachers are coming up with, uh, their thesis uh, projects. Uh, so it's it can be very inspiring, and uh, whenever we're attending conferences and all that, it's not as exciting as Rakwit Ahwe, <laughs> but <laughs> not as entertaining as Rakwit Ahwe. But I think uh, I just want to. Um, note something about continue, uh, continuous learning. You were saying that you have to keep continually. Yeah. Uh, but this is, I think, for everyone nowadays. Yes. yes. For everyone, yeah. where, whatever you're doing, you cannot just depend on what you have known or yeah. what you mm-hmm. have learned mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. And I would talk about teacher. I would say about teachers. Uh, it's probably more for teachers. And as the kind of learning that teachers need to do nowadays, is they na- need to think about deep learning. Um, with all due respect to social media and to, uh, you know, learning while you're on, uh, mm-hmm. you're on bike or, but I would like to advocate for deep learning, mm-hmm. for deep reading, for reading that is uh, that is reflective, mm-hmm. that you and give read, it time, yeah. mm-hmm. that you Definitely. think about what you're reading, mm-hmm. and you learn and you live the experiences of the characters in the books. And I mm-hmm. talk a lot about joyful reading. Mm-hmm. Joyful reading is it can be a novel or it can be a history book, it can be a philosophy book, but it's something a biography. You travel to places, you live somebody else's experience, Absolutely. you widen your mm-hmm. perspective, and. 
this is what I advocate with my teachers. Mm-hmm. I want them to become avid readers mm-hmm. because if the teachers are avid readers, they can then they can inspire their students to become avid le- readers. And I think the problem nowadays is that we're not reading enough. Mm. Uh, I couldn't agree more. On, mm-hmm. that, on that note, uh, you can also listen to books, to audio books, and the future is yes. auditory in one way or in mm-hmm. another. That's why we're doing this podcast, I mm-hmm. think. Uh, there's a lot of content that you can consume, even uh, books that are written uh, on uh, Audible or other platforms where you can actually consume content uh, Absolutely. in an auditory I way. actually have Blinkist on yeah. my phone, and mm-hmm. I do listen to Blinkist while I'm doing my exercise in the mm-hmm. morning. But I use it to give me what yeah. I want and then I go oh that sounds like a mm-hmm. good book then I'll go get mm. the book, book and I'll enjoy I like I'm still old fashioned yeah. I like, like the smell of the book I yeah. like the I, agree I like to too. take Agreed. notes because I yeah. like to, um, for me reading is about taking notes Annotation. and thinking <laughs> yeah. and reflecting and, and that's the deep le- learning that we are maybe nowadays mm-hmm. are missing and really is at risk with yeah. people really connecting so much to social to you know all the mm. media and and um, and technology, yeah. which is and really it's the perfect distracting us. antidote to COVID because mm-hmm. when you're reading a book, you're stepping into somebody else's shoes. Yes. You're living somebody else's life. You can go to any country yeah. that the author takes you to in a book. It's so therapeutic and incredibly educational. And if we want to eradicate, uh, eradicate uh, discrimination and want to eradicate all these prejudices that I talked about at the beginning, mm-hmm. reading is the number one yeah. The number one uh, thing to do because that's how you know others and Absolutely. know other cultures. Yeah. And I think that's a good tip to end on. Yeah. Reading <laughs> is our number one <laughs> tip. Yes. Read more. Not just Read the headlines. Yes. Yes. Not just yeah. the headlines, exactly. <laughs> Huge thanks to all Thank of our you. guests Thank and you. thanks to our listeners. You can get more podcasts at www.kefholdings.com. Just click on Kef Connect to listen or you can listen on your usual apps, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. I'm your host, Sarah Headley Heimers, and you can chat with me on Instagram at Headley Heimers. Until next time, be different and make a difference.